Psalm 139. Our focus of attention will be verses 7 through 12, but we'll read the entire psalm in order to get the context. Psalm 139. To the choir master, a psalm of David. O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from afar. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, behold, O Lord, you know it altogether. You hem me in behind and before and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high, I cannot attain it. Where shall I go from your spirit, or where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me, and your right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, and the light about me be night, even the darkness is not dark to you, the night is bright as the day, for darkness is as light with you. For you formed my inward parts, you knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works, my soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there was none of them. How precious to me are your thoughts, O God! How vast is the sum of them! If I would count them, they are more than the sand. I awake, and I am still with you. O oh, that you would slay the wicked, O God! O men of blood, depart from me! They speak against you with malicious intent. Your enemies take your name in vain. Do I not hate those who hate you, O Lord? And do I not loathe those who rise up against you? I hate them with complete hatred. I count them my enemies. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. And see if there be any grievous way in me. And lead me in the way everlasting. May God's blessing be on this reading from his holy word. Let's pray together. O oh Lord, we ask you very simply to teach us from your word and glorify yourself in the things that are said. Help our minds to grasp what is beyond our comprehension. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Several years ago, I was reading a, a book of theology written by a Puritan author. Um, that's one of my favorite pastimes, you know that. And I was struck by a phrase that I saw on one of the pages. There it was, separated from the rest of the text in bold letters, and it simply said, God is nowhere. God is nowhere. Now that's a striking and a thought-provoking expression. The first thought that came to my mind was, has suddenly this author lapsed into atheism? Or is this author rejecting the God of the Bible? Well, immediately those thoughts were dismissed from my mind. I said to myself, certainly not. But it made me begin to wonder, what was his point? And the point that he made is a very important point. The point is simply that God cannot be confined to or limited to a particular place. God is not like you and me. There's a familiar phrase that we use when we're busy and when people make demands of us. And we say, I can't be in two places at the same time. Right? You probably have said that. You mothers have said that to your children at times when they've wanted things from you. That's true. That's us. We are limited creatures. We might wish for more. We might wish that we could be in more than one place at one time. But we can't. You are only where you are at any given time. You are here right now. You're not at home. You're not driving in a car. You're not somewhere else. You are here. That's the only place that you're at. Many times when I'm away 
on the weekend, I wish that I was here. And on Sundays, it's not unusual for me, if I'm in a different time zone, to be adjusting my thoughts, thinking, our church is meeting now. It may be in the middle of the afternoon somewhere else. If I'm in Europe, it's in the evening. And I'm calculating and I'm thinking, Jason is just starting up to preach. And I'll pray for him as he preaches. Because this is where I would like to be, even though I'm not in this place. Now the problem is that we tend to make God over in our own image, even unintentionally. And we limit him, in this case, to being in one place. This phrase, God is nowhere, profoundly challenges this idea. It expresses very helpfully the doctrine of God's omnipresence. And that is that God is everywhere at all times. Nicholas Byfield, an early 17th century Puritan, put it, I think, beautifully, very simply, but beautifully. He put it this way. God may truly be said to be everywhere and nowhere. Sounds like a conundrum, doesn't it? He may truly be said to be everywhere and nowhere. Sometimes theologians phrase it this way. They say God has no local mode. That is, unlike us, his essence or his being is not contained in any single place. And that's what the Puritan author was trying to say when he indicated those words, God is nowhere. We can't place him in a specific locale and say, that's the place where God is, because God is really and truly everywhere. Now, notice how David expresses this in our psalm. It's a psalm of praise and of comfort. In the first six verses, David speaks of God's omniscience. That God knows all things. He knows all things fully. He knows all things completely. God does not need to collect knowledge. God doesn't have to investigate in order to learn. In fact, we can say this of God. God cannot learn. Because God knows all things. There are very few things that we can say God cannot do. God cannot lie. God cannot be unfaithful to himself. God cannot learn. You and I spend all of our lives learning. I'm a teacher. I seek to teach to help students learn. But God can't learn because God knows all things. God cannot be surprised by something. God does not have an aha moment when something suddenly dawns on him or becomes clear because he knows all things. And David is expressing that in the first six verses of Psalm 139. And he takes great comfort in this. As he speaks about God's knowledge, you know when I sit down and when I rise up, you discern my thoughts from afar. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. David says, even before he speaks, God knows what he is about to speak. And he says in verse six that the knowledge of this is too wonderful it's too high, I cannot attain it. Although he's just expressed it. See, he knows something of it. He knows that God has all knowledge. He can express the truth of that. But still it is so profound that he can't get his hands on it. He can't grasp it fully. He can't get to the bottom of it. But he knows that God knows all things. Now after he speaks about God's omniscience, he moves into a contemplation of God's being in verses 7 through 12. And in verse 7, he asks some rhetorical questions. Now, you know, a rhetorical question is a question that doesn't need an answer. It effectively answers itself. It's interesting that David actually does answer the rhetorical questions here. But notice verse 7. Where shall I go from your spirit? Now, it's possible, I suppose, to conceive of a being who would know all things, but still be placed in a particular location. We could conceive of someone like that. But David knows that though God has all knowledge, God also is present everywhere. Where shall I go from your spirit? Or where shall I flee from your presence? Now, the, 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 the good theologian, the, the Bible-believing Christian, knows how to answer those questions immediately. There isn't any place that we can go from God's Spirit. 
There isn't any place that we may flee or run to from his presence. The, the Hebrew verb here is actually very interesting because the way it's translated it makes us think that David's trying to get away from God, but rather he's really speaking about going to God. Is there any place that I can go where you aren't present? And the answer, of course, is no. But in verses 8 and 9 and following, he gives some really interesting answers because he uses the language of location to describe or to, or to respond to these rhetorical questions. Verse 8 speaks about up and down. If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, or if I go down to the grave, you are there. This idea of up and down appears several other times in the scriptures. In Deuteronomy chapter 30 and Romans chapter 10, Indeed, God is in heaven, and we expect this. But David says, if we go down, if we think about the grave, if we go to Sheol, there is God as well. See, immediately, he's challenging the notion that God's presence can be limited to heaven, because God is in the grave as well. And so David immediately begins by thinking of up and down. And by the way, if any of you were in chapel on Thursday and heard President Kim at Westminster I said to him after he preached on Psalm 139 that he had given me some ideas for my sermon. So some of this comes from Professor Kim. The up and down and then what's next. In verse 9, he speaks about the east and the west. And he does so using poetic language. If I take the wings of the morning. Now, what does that make you think of? Doesn't it make you think of the dawn? And the dawn comes to us immediately where? In the east. In order to see the sun come up. Uh, it's a beautiful expression here because the idea is that light, as soon as the sun breaks the plane of the horizon and comes up, that light immediately travels to us and we see it with our eye and perhaps we even feel it with our bodies. That's the wings of the morning. That's the rapid spread of light as the sun crosses the horizon. If I look to the east, if I think about the sunrise... I know that I will find God there as well, because the light spreads from the east to the west as soon as the sun touches the horizon. This kind of language is echoed in Malachi chapter 4. For you who fear my name, the sun of righteousness shall rise up with healing in its wings. The sun of righteousness will rise up, turning to the east. Here David says that God is in the east, but then he says that God is also in the west because he immediately speaks of the uttermost parts of the sea. Now if you know your Bible geography well, you realize that the sea is to the west of the Holy Land. The sea is that vast body of water to the Mediterranean that you must go west from the Holy Land in order to go to. David doesn't use the word east, he doesn't use the word west, but he's speaking about everything that can be seen from the rising of the sun to the sea in the west. Wherever I go, God is there. Up, down, east, west, I cannot flee from the presence of God. Verse 10, David picks up this thought. God is with him wherever he goes. Even there, in the east or the west, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. You see, David is taking comfort in the fact that wherever it is that he finds himself, he's in the genuine presence of the God of heaven and earth. In verses 11 and 12, he picks up a, a, a different kind of picture, and he speaks about darkness. Even darkness does not hinder God. Now, what does darkness do to us? Darkness obscures and it hides. You know, we're living in a world where darkness is increasingly less familiar to us. Now, that may sound like a crazy idea, but it's true. Think about your house. How many little lights are there on at night in your house? The, the stove light, uh, the, the clock there, the microwave oven, maybe your coffee maker, the phone charger, your computer... Who knows what else? If you go in the living room, the, the, 
the, the DVD or the cable TV or even the TV itself. There's all kinds of little lights. And it's easy to maneuver ourselves around because of those lights. But when you're in pitch darkness, it can be a frightening thing. Because there's, it's sensory deprivation. There's no um, points that help us to maneuver. David wants us to think about that kind of darkness. Evil deeds are done in darkness. Because darkness covers them over. But not to God. God is there and God sees. God is everywhere. The prophet Isaiah in 66.1 puts it this way. Thus says the Lord, heaven is my throne. And the earth is my footstool. What is the house that you would build for me? And what is the place of my rest? And then sometimes we stop there. But listen to how it continues. All these things my hand has made. And so all these things came to be, declares the Lord. You know what the Lord is saying? Even place as we know it. Heaven, God's throne, and the earth, his footstool is something that is a created thing. God existed before heaven was created. God filled all. Now that's beyond our comprehension to understand what that's about. But that's what the Lord is saying. Even the heaven is something that he has made, a place in which he manifests himself. He made heaven and he made earth. The Lord does not contain himself within his own work, you see. The Lord doesn't make a box called heaven and earth and then fit himself into it. But rather he exists as he is always, everywhere, and in all places. This is who God is. Place as we know it is a created thing. Jeremiah 23, 24. We read this verse last week in our worship. The Lord asked the question, can a man hide himself in secret places so that I can't see him, declares the Lord? Do I not fill heaven and earth, declares the Lord. See, Nicholas Byfield was right when he said, God is everywhere and God is nowhere. God is in every place. And yet there's no one place in which or to which God can be confined. He is everywhere. Now, there are objections. Actually, there are many. There are more than I can uh, deal with in the next few moments. But there are objections to this. Someone might say, but God is depicted on his throne. And turn us to Isaiah 6. The very, pardon me, the very famous incident where the prophet sees the Lord high and exalted. Ezekiel chapter 1 where the prophet has a very similar view of God on his throne. Psalm 82, which speaks about the Lord in heaven. Revelation 4 and 5, where we have that wonderful picture of the triune God and the worship that is offered to him. God is depicted on a throne in heaven many times in scripture. Well, of course he is. And those things are all true. Heaven, the throne of heaven, is the place where God manifests his presence on his throne. But none of these depictions of God are intended to limit him to one single place. Rather, in heaven, he shows his glory and his grace to creatures in order that we might be able to worship him properly. We need, we need a view of heaven in order to help us to be able to to worship him. He is so completely different to us. That creator-creature distinction, which we mention frequently, is so important that God condescends to manifest his presence in heaven so that you and I will be able to bow the knee and adore him in all of his beauty. When Solomon dedicates the temple that he built in Jerusalem, he says this, Will God dwell on earth? Behold, the heaven and the highest heaven cannot contain you. How much less this house that I build. Solomon understood, you see. It may have been a beautiful temple. It may have been the place where God demonstrated his presence among his people on earth. And yet Solomon understood that all that it was was a symbol 
of the greatness and the glory of heaven because not even heaven, I'm sorry, the goodness and glory of God, because not even heaven is able to contain the majesty and the glory of the one who is there. Isaiah 57, 15 says this, For thus says the one who is high and lifted up, who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy, I dwell in the high and holy place, heaven, but you probably know what the rest of it is. And also with him who is of a contrite and lowly spirit. The Lord says, yes, I dwell in heaven. But I also dwell on earth. And I dwell on earth with my people. Who are humble and lowly and contrite. God can be in two places at once. Because God is in all places at once. So that objection is a fair enough objection. It arises from the scriptures, but it has a good answer. The answer is that God manifests his presence to us in heaven, but he does not confine himself to the place that he has created. Another objection might be, but, but what about the fact that the Bible speaks in many places about the right hand of God? About being at the right hand of God. You'll find that in Psalm 2, Psalm 110, Acts chapter 2, in many places, especially speaking about the Lord Jesus. Well, what is that phrase intending to do? It's a symbolic representation of power and authority for us. It is intended to say that our Lord Jesus Christ has been exalted to the highest place of honor and authority in all of the universe. But it's not intended to limit God to that place. So that Jesus sitting on the right hand of God is not intended for us to think that God is only there and Jesus is at his right hand. Rather, it's intended to teach us that Jesus is the one who is exalted above all others. Which leads to a third objection. Someone might ask, well, what about Jesus? Doesn't he have a local presence? Wasn't he really and truly on earth during his ministry? And isn't he now in heaven making intercession for us at the right hand of God? I hope all of you can answer this question. The answer is, yes, of course. Yes, he had an earthly, a local presence on earth. Yes, now he is local in heaven. Of course he does. The reason we say that is that his humanity is true humanity. Everything that can be said about human nature may be said about the Lord Jesus. His human nature, body and soul, has all of the physical limitations of all humans. But Jesus is not simply a human, though he's a true human. He is also God in the flesh. He's also the God-man. And his divine nature has all of the perfections of deity. He didn't lose any divine perfections by joining himself with our flesh. And so while his human nature is limited and local, his divine nature shares all of the characteristics of the divine nature. And it's not limited by his humanity. We can say that Jesus Christ is present with us here as we worship. Even though in heaven... His human nature is present. I'm starting to blow your minds, aren't I? Uh, Christian theology ought to do that. It ought to do that for us. It ought to make us bow down. It's, it is a marvelous wonder to consider our Savior and what the incarnation is all about. That everything that can be said truly about God may be said about him and everything that may be said truly about us may be said about him. Truly God and truly man. And so the fact that Jesus is one with us in no way contradicts the omnipresence of God, of even of his divine nature. His divine nature is present everywhere. Now there are other objections that we could consider. I, I thought that those were, were sufficient for uh, what we're doing this afternoon. Let's ask the question then, well, what does this doctrine mean for us? Well, I want to suggest several things. You know, as I was reading through the commentaries on Psalm 139, I saw something that recurred that in some ways I, I troubled me. And that is that when many of the commentators come to verses 11 and 12, which speak about darkness, 
they immediately think of sin. And they think that David there is recognizing the fact that he's a sinner and that his sin, he, he, he's, he's, he's contemplating the fact that it's foolish for him to sin in the presence of God. But Spurgeon's Treasury of David and William Plummer's commentary on the Psalms took a different view of this, and, and I really believe that they are right. That that's not the emphasis of Psalm 139. Now, there is a proper application to that. We could make that application. But I don't really want to say any more about it, because I don't think that's what the psalmist is saying here. Is it true that it's foolish, even in the darkness, to sin? Of course it is. But there's something that's much better here. Psalm 139 is intended to bring us comfort and peace. As David contemplates God, he does so with a sense of joy and comfort. And that's David's great point. Wherever we go, God is there. God is with us in the safe and easy places. God is with us in the dangerous places. God is with us in the valley of the shadow of death. He's with you when you pillow your head at night and go to sleep. God is there to watch over you. God is with you as you drive. God is with you as you eat. God is with you. He watches over you. He keeps you. He's with you in the doctor's office. He's with you when you go to the blood laboratory. He's with you in the ICU unit. He's near you when your car breaks down on the highway. He's with you when evil men seek to come against you. God is there. And brothers and sisters, we need to remind ourselves of this and strengthen our faith with this truth. The Lord will never let you out of his sight. I was thinking about the fact that we human parents may lose sight of our children. That's the the great fear of every parent. It happened to us once. We were on a busy train station somewhere in England. And we had our suitcases with us. And we had Susie, who was probably three or four years old. And in trying to get our suitcases, she got off the train before we did and disappeared. Now, some very kind woman saw what was happening and took her by the hand and brought her back to us. But for a few moments, there was real panic. We're in a foreign country, and we've just lost sight of our toddler. Some of you parents have been through experiences like that, and you know what it's like. Or, in the situation of life that my wife and I are in now, your children grow up and they leave home. That's what they're intended to do. And you don't see them there either. That relationship between parent and child is, I don't want to say broken, but it's in a sense ended in the way that it was previously. But that never happens with God and his children. We are never out of his sight. Never. Wherever you go, whatever you do, whatever difficulty you face, you're in the presence of God. He is there with you, showing his love to you. That leads me to a second application. And I, 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 don't, I, don't, I don't know that I've ever done this before, but I want to read you something from Thomas Watson, yes, I've read things before while I'm preaching, but this application is so good that I thought, I'll just use Watson. Thomas Watson is one of the, the most accessible of the Puritan writers. He often writes with uh, just um, comfort and encouragement and strength. Listen to this. He has five or six or seven applications in his exposition of the Shorter Catechism when it speaks about God's infinity. And he recognizes that omnipresence is an aspect of God's infinity. Who is God? God is a spirit, infinite, eternal, and unchangeable. When he's dealing with that word infinite. Listen to this. If God be everywhere present, then for a Christian to walk with God is not impossible. God is not only in heaven, but he is on earth too. Isaiah 66, 1. Heaven is his throne, there he sits. The earth is his footstool, there he stands. He is everywhere present. Therefore, we may come to walk with God. Enoch walked with God, Genesis 5.21. If God were confined to heaven, a trembling soul might think, how can I converse with God? How can I walk with him? 
who lives in excelsis. You know, that's, you know, the, the Christmas carol, Gloria in excelsis Deo, in the highest. How can I walk with him who lives above the upper region? But God is not confined to heaven. He is omnipresent. He is above us, yet he is about us. He is near to us. Acts 17, 27. Though he be not far from the assembly of the saints, he stands in the congregation of the mighty. Psalm 82, 1. He is present with us. God is in every one of us. So that here on earth we may walk with God. In heaven the saints rest with him. On earth they walk with him. To walk with God is to walk by faith. We are said to draw nigh to God, Hebrews 10.22, and to see him, Hebrews 11.27, as seeing him who is invisible, and to have fellowship with him, Hosea 1.3. Our fellowship is with the Father. Those who may, th thus we may take a turn with him every day by faith. Now that's an old English way. If you've ever seen uh, Pride and Prejudice, you know that they use that phrase. Would you take a turn with me? And it simply means, would you walk with me? That's what he, he intends. Thus we may take a turn. We may walk with him every day by faith. Tis, now he, he, uh, he speaks in the language of, of kingdom. Tis a slighting of God not to walk with him. If a king be in, pre in presence, it is slighting him to neglect him and walk with the page. You don't walk with the servant. You walk with the king. There's no walk in the world so sweet as to walk with God. Psalm 89.15 they shall walk in the light of thy countenance. Psalm 138, 5. Yea, they shall sing in the ways of the Lord. It is like walking among beds of spices which send forth a fragrant, fragrant perfume. Isn't that wonderful? Because God is everywhere. You may walk with him wherever you are on this earth. What a comfort. What a, what a great blessing that is. But you know, the greatest application of them all is simply the word Emmanuel, God with us. And that's what we celebrate in the Advent season. But this was not intended to be a, a sermon to prepare us for Advent, not at all. But still, how can we think about the presence of God without thinking about the presence of Jesus Christ, who became one with us? We said already that he took upon himself the, 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 the second person of the Godhead took to himself our human nature and became one with us and suffered and died and rose and ascended into heaven. And now that human nature is at the right hand of God making intercession for us. Yes, God is everywhere, but for the believer, the most precious truth of the omnipresence of God is that Jesus Christ is with us. Emmanuel. Glory be to God. Let's pray. O oh Lord, thank you for these comforting, encouraging, helpful words from David. Thank you for sending your spirit to him, causing him to write these words that stretch our minds, that cause us to bow down in wonder, and yet fill our hearts with joy that we are never far from you, that you are always near, and that you watch over and keep your beloved children. Lord, help us, as Thomas Watson has said, to walk with you, because we may walk with you wherever we are on this earth. Bless us, we pray, in Jesus' name.